Well, all the ingredients are here, aren't they? A very much informed lower league team. Is this the chance? It is the chance, and it's the goal that they create. And score two. David Bale puts his name up in lights at Wembley. Which has been in chaos off the pitch. Hello and welcome back to another episode by Inside the Changer Room. Today we are joined by a man who started his training days at local club Blackburn Rovers. He then went on to Cambridge, Preston, Lincoln, Port Vale, Wimbledon, Cardiff, Queen Park Rangers and Wickham <laughs> Wanderers. Of course, he is now the current Wickham Wanderers first team manager and in my opinion, one of the best EFL managers around. We are joined by Gareth Ainsworth. Gareth, thank you ever so much for coming on. No worries, James. Thanks. Thanks for that intro. That's, uh, that's a lot to live up to, but um, no, I appreciate it. Thank not, you. Not a bad intro, eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Yeah, we can talk more if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep, keep, keep reeling off the, uh, the compliment. Coming, eh? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jacob, joined by you as ever. How are you? It's yeah. Cheers. Yeah, good to see you, Jacob. Thank you. Um, yeah, Gareth. Oh, yes. Jesus, what a career, mate. What a career. And, uh, and, and obviously, you, you, you're managing in the beautiful game as it is now. But let's go right back, let's go right back to the start, um, where it all began for you at, at, at like we say, hometown, hometown, hometown club, Blackburn Rovers. Yeah. Um, how did you get into, into the wonderful game? Um, yeah, I mean, mine is a story that um, will be a lot different to uh, um, loads of young players nowadays. A few players when I was young, it's different to their story, and it hopefully give hope to some people who are nowadays who aren't at academies and aren't aren't going here, there, and everywhere training. Because I wasn't in an academy until I was until I joined Blackburn at 16. My first ever time at a professional club was my first day at 16 years old. I was never a schoolboy at Blackburn, and that was the big thing to have to be a schoolboy at Blackburn or Preston or Blackpool, you know, Lancashire lad. So growing up in Blackburn. Um, we, uh, it, I, you know, a lot of my friends were schoolboys here and playing for the top teams. Honestly, I think getting my, I, I was a good player at primary school, but secondary school, I was a little bit shy, a little bit of a late developer. I didn't get in the secondary school team till third year. So that will be now year nine. They're talking now. I can't get my head around these years. I've got a boy in year eight. So change it every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So year nine was the, the, my first time I got in the school team at secondary school. So a real late developer. Um, and I went to play, uh, playing for the school, playing for uh, the church, playing for a Sunday team in, in a place called Clitheroe, called Henthorne United. And the Henthorne manager, um, I can't remember his surname, his first name was Ken, but apparently, as the story goes, he, he rang Blackburn Rovers and said, I've got, I've got this kid who's, who's not bad, come and have a watch of him on a Sunday. Unbeknown to me, I, I didn't know any of this was going on, uh, they came down. I had a good game for Henthorne, and uh, and I got invited to a trial game. Uh, and back in those days, you're talking 1987, something like that now. And and it was A and B teams. You had your first team, you had your reserve team, and then your youth team was split into A and B teams. And my game was uh, down at Pleasanton for the A team against Carlisle United. And in the same team, in the same Blackburn Rovers team, was uh, David May. He went on to play for Man United, winning the Champions League. Jason yep. Wilcox, who, who won the Premier League with Blackburn Rovers. These these were playing in the in the A team for Blackburn. Obviously, they weren't household names then. Keith Hill, even the, the Rochdale manager, uh, sorry, the Bolton manager. And um, and so I turned up for this game uh, and uh, and I scored a hat trick uh, in my first trial game for Blackburn Rovers. Won five two. I always remember it. Um, and I got invited back and invited back and eventually, um, yeah, just just coming up to. I think January of my last year at school, mum and dad stopped the car. I remember, I remember exactly where I was, right in town, right out after a game one day, outside a town centre, um, and said, "Look, Blackburn have offered you apprenticeship forms, uh, and we think it's a good idea. Two years as a YTS." And I was just over the moon, honestly. It was, it was a dream come true. I'm a lifelong Blackburn fan. Watched Blackburn since I was six, seven years old. Season tickets at thirteen, fourteen. And now I had a I had, I had a chance to become a, a professional footballer with, with what I still think is the best team in the world. But uh, it was Blackburn, so yeah, brilliant, brilliant day. And and 
gives hope hopefully to kids now who aren't even in academies there's still yeah. hope oh, there's, uh, there's always that chance you can make it yeah, I mean, that, that first day, obviously, it's your hometown club and you didn't have sort of that time to acclimatise like, you know, you would do it getting from a really young age through an academy. Yeah. Like, did, did you find that daunting at all? Or how, how did you actually take that uh, right at the beginning? Uh, well, do you know what? I remember we, we, we had a holiday booked. Uh, Mum and Dad took us on holiday and I missed about the first three days. So when I got in, the apprentices that were there, and I knew a couple of them, there was a guy called James Beatty, not, not the James Beatty, Ironically enough, another guy called James Beach, he was at Blackburn Rovers. He was a Northern Ireland international. And uh, he was mates with me through the A team. And, and I went in and he showed me the ropes that day. And it was, the ropes were, I looked after Colin Andrew and Frank Stapleton, who were two Blackburn players. I had to go and get their kits from the kit room, <laughs> fold them up in their places, go and clean their boots, put their boots in their places, Brilliant. walk through the first team dressing room with my head down, hoping nobody spoke to me because you didn't, you didn't, you didn't want any of the first teamers to speak to you because they were just... You know, it wasn't abusing you, but it was it was a few comments like, you know, you had to earn your right to be in that dressing room. And uh, and the apprentices were there to make the tea, clean the boots and put the kit out. And if you were lucky enough after two years, you'd you'd get in that dressing room. But no, it was a it was a real baptism of fire. I mean, there's one story that when I was growing up, my hero was a guy called Simon Garner. Um, and obviously you've probably heard of him. He got great goal scorer, went on to play for Wickham, ironically. Uh, but he was Blackburn Rovers record goal scorer. Um, and I always used to watch him, modeled my game on him, loved him quick, sharp in the box. And I remember going in and saying to uh, one of the boys, like, Where, where's, where's Garns like? I, I really wanted to see Garns on my first day. And they said, oh, he's, he, I don't know. He's, and so went into the first team dressing room and give Colin Hendry's kit and went, uh, excuse me, you, you know Simon Garner is like, I just wanted to see him. And Colin went, he's probably out, out on the main pitch. So I thought, oh, but obviously this is why he's he's the player he is. He's, he's brilliant. He's out there practicing now while everyone's still getting changed. So I walked out on the pitch, I walked down the tunnel just for a sneaky view for where Simon Garner was. And I, I looked on the pitch, there's nobody there, no footballs or anything. And then I just heard this coughing in the dugout and I turned around and Simon Garner's there smoking a cigarette before training in, in the dugout of Blackburn Rovers. And I'm 16 thinking, this is my hero. And, th and he went to me, don't, don't do these. That, these are no good for you, mate. These are no good for you. And that was, that was my initial sort of meeting of Simon Garner. But Brilliant. on the pitch, lots of play, you know. And uh, uh, yeah, he was, a, he was a great, great guy to be around and good inspiration for me. Yeah, so you obviously joined at 16, spent a couple of years at Blackburn, but then you were at 18 released. I mean, especially with being in your hometown club, was that hard to take at the time? Yeah, really tough, Jacob. You know, I was uh, on my birthday. I'm, I'm, it was, I don't know. It's probably yeah. documented the 10th, 10th of May is my birthday. And, uh, and I do it now. You know, I've got to do it now as a manager. And you, do, you, you, you tell these players, for the good of the players, it doesn't feel like it on the day. And it didn't feel like it was... For me on the day but it turned out to be probably the best thing because it made me just more desire to to, uh, to go and make it and prove people wrong but yeah a manager called Don McKay um and yeah yeah he released me and uh yeah it's uh it's the hardest thing I've ever been through you know it's uh, my birthday 18th birthday we were going out that night we still went out I can't, I can't say it killed me that much because I still went out for a beer that night but um it was a uh, it was a Friday Friday afternoon and uh yeah, Don McKay said that we're not we're offering four players the contracts. Peter Thorne was one who went on for a great career, but I think the others fell away. Um, but I definitely wasn't one, and that was my days at Blackburn done. And yeah, the world caves in for a bit, but mum and dad were great. Dad especially supported me all throughout. And uh, yeah, I remember writing. There's no emails on there, so you're writing then to every club. You're writing a letter to all the local clubs. Can I have a trial? I've been at Blackburn, and uh, yeah, so that was my journey of, uh, of trying to trying to get back in the game. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, as you did try and get her back in the game, you then went to Northwich Victoria back in 1991. Was How did that move come about? Was that, like you just said, writing to them or did they approach you? No, it, it come through Preston, actually. Um, Preston gave me a, a letter back and said, do you want to come in and train? There might not be anything here, but keep your fitness up, which was fantastic. A guy called Walter Joyce, and he was an ex-Blackman player, but he was Warren Joyce, who was the Man United and Wigan he just he was the Wigan manager a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, it was his father. Um, so I went I went in and Walter got in touch with Sam McElroy, uh, the Man United legend, and Norman Whiteside. They were the team at Northwich, and 
I went down there um, and didn't sign a contract, which was a good move because my dad didn't want me to sign a contract, but um, went down there and played in the what is the National League now. Um, and believe me, at 18 years old, you learn a lot playing in the National League. You know, it was a, it was a real... I bet you do. Yeah, honestly, James, it was real, really, you know, puts, puts it in perspective. Men's football, and again, perfect for me, what I needed. Um, and ended up, uh, as you know, going back to Preston. I've been on trial, a couple of training, but I went there and that was my, then my first professional club and uh, Preston gave me my debut in, I think, January 92. I left Northwich, went there. Like you say there, like you say there Gareth, about dropping into non-league at 18 years old and you see a lot of youngsters now that are at Premier League clubs and in the academies and happy to kind of sit there and, and play under 23 football and things like that. What yeah. do you say to them sort of players that kind of ha happy to sit there? It's so important nowadays to just go and play football, isn't it? Yeah. And, and just go and pick up every experience that you can. Yeah, totally with you. You know, I, I think that the Premier League is, is that much of a product now. It's a fantastic, super talented league. And yeah. the players in it are brilliant. The first touch and the speed of thought is, is fabulous. And so in, in these academies, if you're going to go into the Premier League, I think these academies are great. The 23s is great because it's a, sl it's a slower game and then explodes and you've got to make the right decisions. And so that's great. But how many of them players actually are going to make it into the Premier League? Only, only a small percentage. So it's the yeah. rest of them that I think need to play football, need to know what it's about. And, and for me, the old reserve league, there used to be a reserve league, a central league, it was called where yeah. the yeah, reserves played in. And, uh, and I would love to see that back. I really would. I think that the players who don't play, you know, they play in the reserves and, and yeah. your best apprentices play in the reserves and you make up this mix of players that some are getting experience in men's football. Some are coming back from injury, you know, your big players. And I, I, I was lucky enough to play in the reserves at Blackburn Rovers. You know, I played with some real good players. I played against Paul Gascoigne and against John Barnes. You know, these players in the reserve league that... Paul Gascoigne playing for Newcastle Reserves coming back from injury. And you know? also, they were fantastic, wonderful experiences that, uh, that really made, made a difference in my career. So I'd say they need to play football. And, yeah. and that's the thing, that Gareth, like you say about the reserve team football, about first team players coming back from injury, where kids at 18, 19, instead of being kind of chucked into a relegation battle or something like that at 18, 19, where there's so much pressure of having three points with eight, nine, 10,000 fans on your, on your back or whatever, where it's a pressurised situation, they can go and play reserve football kit and they against good pros, yeah. pros that are returning from injury and learn off them and then yeah. gain the experiences that they need. Definitely, definitely. I mean, 23s against 23s is okay, but there's no real pros in that. There's, no. there's a scattering now and again, but playing against the, the names that are the press are there, the TV's there filming. There's a bit of pressure because you're playing against these these famous players in the reserves, but you need to, what you learn off them. You learn off people, you know, and and, and you've got to look after yourself as well, you know. I mean, there's some tough, tough names that you, you used to play against that wouldn't mess about they, at corners, you know, they'd be they'd be giving you the elbow just just because they wanted to score a goal. This 34-year-old and I'm a 16-year-old, I'm getting elbow, but it's part of the game, it's part of learning, you know, and I'm not saying that young, but I'm saying... Once you turn 18, 19, you then need to start yeah. mixing because there's some fantastic 18, 19 year olds in the National League, in the lower yeah. leagues, you know. but there's some brilliant ones in the Premier League as well. So I'm not saying, yeah. but it, there is a split, you know, there is a split. Yeah. So uh, we've got to find a happy medium there. Like you said a minute ago, Gareth, you obviously went back to Preston. Um, how did it, how did it feel, feel being offered a chance to get back into the professional yeah. game so young? Every footballer remembers their league debut, you know, and, uh, I remember mine away at Shrewsbury. We, we lost 2-0, um, but I had a decent game. You know, I was okay, and it, it, it gave me a six-month contract in the professional game. Ronnie Jepson, Graham Shaw, lower league legend players, you know, at Preston North End. And uh, we had the plastic pitch, of course, at Preston, one of the last ones in the country. So, uh, yeah, but you always remember your debut, you know. To, to, some of, the, some of the moments you do is you, you, you always remember that league day where you played in the football league. You became a professional footballer that day and that, that was me at um, Gay Meadow it used to be, yeah. But um, yeah, it was, uh, it was tough again because 
six months later, they, they told me once again I wasn't good enough. So I get <laughs> another, release, another release job. But again, part of my story, you know. I mean, yeah. I mean, you were, yeah, like you said, you were released, obviously, joining Cambridge in 92 and then going back to Northridge, Victoria as well after that. Was that a frustrating right. time? Was that a frustrating time in your career that it, it was a case that you couldn't kind of settle in one place? You were kind of being moved from pillar to, pillar to post in, in, at such a young age. Yeah, it definitely changed, you know, but looking back, it was hell at the time. I really didn't enjoy it. I went down to Cambridge and lived with a family that I didn't even know. I, mean, I lived in Diggs, you know, they had the kid wow. that was being right around the house. And honestly, and it was, it was like, oh my God, where am I? Like, it was, it was a tough place to go. Um, they had this, this cat. I always remember this cat and it's, to this day, I don't like cats because of this. <laughs> yeah, to tell you, this well, cat. God, I got my hand out then. Oh, honestly, honestly, <laughs> honestly, I'll tell you, to this day, they had this cat and, uh, I went away, I went back home for the weekend one, one weekend and I come back down to Cambridge United and I was in this box room, little TV that I brought from home, single bed. And uh, I walked back in my room and there was a nice little present there from the cat left on my bed. So that was oh, me no. and Captain, yeah. And I'm thinking I'm miles away from home. And it was tough, you know, but it, it did build character. And I had a manager called John Beck uh, and he obviously documented, um, loved his, his direct football, but he was brilliant with me. He worked on my strengths, knew what I was. Um, and he, he actually told me, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll get you in, in the Premier League. He, he actually said that to me at, at 18 years old. And, and I didn't believe him. I thought he'd just saying that to, to, to get me to sign. And, uh, but true to his word, you know, he, he, got, he got the Preston job while I was at Cambridge and he took me with him. So again, back to Preston. Um, you know, it made me the person I am. It made me tougher and it, it, living away from home. And, and John Beck certainly did. But um, I think that second spell at Preston then, um, that was when I truly started making my mark in football on the right yeah. wing. And, uh, and yeah, we're lucky to get to Wembley in, in the, the second season under Becky there as well. Yeah, I mean, you did get to Wembley, didn't you? And I think um, you ended up reaching the playoffs in 94. And this is quite a bit of a weird story when I was looking at it, is that you ended up actually losing out to your current club, Wickham, yeah. in that playoff final. Um, I mean, sum up that season under under John Beck and, and being at Preston. And like you said, obviously, making your mark in football. Do you, did you feel like returning for that second spell, you thought, no, I, I've, I've actually really arri arrived now? Yeah, you could tell the difference in me, James. I was more experienced. I was a, I was more confident in the dressing room. As I say, I was quiet. People won't believe this, but I wasn't the most outgoing kid at school. I'm now, and people look at me and think he's on stage, he sings songs, he's in the front of the crowd. But in the early days, I was a little bit timid, a little bit sort of worked people out, but I'd worked football out by now, and, and I was 21 years old. David Moyes had come into the club. Um, he he was he was centre half. Um, we had some we had some real good players. Tony Ellis, a striker that we had up front, who scored bundles of goals that year. And uh, and to play alongside some of those good names, it would give me confidence. You know, really, really did make my mark. But yeah, the ironic thing was Wickham Wanderers beat us in the playoff final at Wembley. And I'll never forget because every time I walk in at Wickham Wanderers, uh, even though I'm manager, there's this there's this blooming picture in the in the hallway of, of Wickham winning at Wembley. And, and I'm in it, in a Preston kit. And I'm like, I'll never forget this, you know. So, Do you not ask anyone uh, to take it down? <laughs> no, no, I can't. It's part of their history. It's one of their, their good days. And, uh, I think you've been reminded, like, though, haven't you, while you've been there? Every time I have to look at it, I remember I was on the losing side. But no, <laughs> yeah, hopefully we can, we can replace uh, some, some great memories to come. But yeah, it was a fantastic time at Preston. And, uh, and I got a lot to thank John Beck for, yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that following season afterwards as well, Preston reached the playoffs again. Did yeah. going into that playoff campaign for like a second year running, was that really drilled into you that like we're going to, obviously you didn't unfortunately get promoted, but was it drilled into you that you almost tried to avenge the season before? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, do you know, at a young age, you don't, um, you, you're quite fearless at a young age. You don't really think like that. I really don't, you know. Um, I think at an older age, and more experienced than me was. But again, at 21, 22 years old, the, the, the story that season was that they signed a 17-year-old lad from Man United and he, uh, the manager took me in the, the, uh, the office on the Friday and said, I'm replacing you tomorrow with this kid from Man United. And it was David Beckham. So I, my days were truly numbered that season. You know, he came in and he was fantastic. Um, scored two goals in his first three games. I think he bent a corner direct in. And, but coming back to your question of the playoffs, yeah, we didn't... As a young boy, you didn't really go, right, this is, this is our chances of avenge. It was just another game. I was just on the crest of a wave, enjoying my football. 
but I knew John Beck had left that season and he ended up going to Lincoln. Um, and my appearances became more scattered. You know, Gary Peters took over. Nothing wrong with Gary. Just didn't fancy me in, in the style of football he wanted. And uh, I think the season after, early in that season, I went to Lincoln City because John Beck was there. And again, um, get a bit of stick for following Becky around, but he was the one who was uh, was the best for me. And, and I think Lincoln just carried on from Preston. I was really flying then and, uh, and made a big mark there. Yeah, I mean, like you said, I mean, in the October of 1995, you did join Lincoln. Was there any other interest from any other clubs or was it for you like such an easy decision to join Lincoln? No, it was an easy decision. Uh, and unlike the moves that would come after Lincoln, there wasn't really any talk of anyone else. You know, it was uh, Lincoln were low, low down in, this, in the bottom division. So League Two now, they were quite low down. Uh, I think they were bottom actually. And I, I, and I used to, well, I remember speaking to my dad and saying, look, if there's one person who can get him off the bottom, it's John Beck and, and I'll go there. And there was, um, there was a guy called Barry Richardson, a goalkeeper who'd gone there from Preston, Terry Fleming, Stevie Holmes, all these players that we played with together at Preston, they'd gone. And they were ringing me up saying, Gaz, get down here. It's, it's, it's good. And, you know, coming into me sort of early 20s, again, moved into Diggs um, with a great family. Uh, and uh, that's when I really started kicking off with uh, the team spirit, the nights out, the, the real sort of, to say Wimbledon was the crazy gang. Lincoln wasn't far behind, believe me. I'll bet you've got some stories there, Gareth, that you can't repeat. <laughs> I've got some. Uh, I've got some great stories, you know. And as a single boy, it was okay in them days. But uh, it was, uh, yeah. I, I went through a lot of uh, good times at Lincoln. Still, still, probably. If it's, if you say what club would you stay in touch with most players from? It's probably the Lincoln days. You know, there was there was a, a lad called Kevin Austin who died unfortunately last year. Um, great centre half we had, and he was very young, 40, 40 early forties. He died and. We all went to his funeral in Sheffield and all the Lincoln boys were there. And it was like that that was a group you were comfortable with. You know, that was that was a group that were there for each other. We all lived in Lincoln. We all went out together in Lincoln. And John Beck signed everyone who was single would go out and, and uh, have the best team spirit going. So, uh, yeah, great days at Lincoln and two real, really special years there. I mean, yeah, that, that following season, you scored 22 goals for Lincoln and you were named in the team of the year. What was it that sort of clicked within yourself that sort of really allowed you to push on that season? Would you say it was the camaraderie of the team or, or was there another factor at play there? No, I think, it, yeah, it was me developing again. I felt as fit as I'd ever felt. You know, I think when John got the sack at Preston, I, I was flying then as well. I loved, I loved Becky, but I got, a, I got a knee injury at Preston and I remember that scuppered me and he, he got the sack while I had my knee injury and I always felt a little bit guilty that, you know, I was I was a good player for John and, and I, I wasn't contributing. So when I went to Lincoln, I was fit. I kept fit. Um, I, I, I think in my in my two years at Lincoln, I think I missed one game in, in the whole two seasons, you know, and that was for suspension. I, you know, I was never injured. Um, we had a style where he, he, he would play to my strengths. He really would do, you know, back post headers, getting the ball over the top, using my pace. And, uh, and yeah, it flourished. I, I just on the crest of the waves, you know, sometimes you, you have no idea, you know, you hit shots and you think you're aiming for the top corner, it goes in the bottom corner, but you take it and it's, it's that kind of time for you. And, uh, and that was my, my absolute purple patch at Lincoln. But um, yeah, we, we, we had some great players as well. So I can't, I can't thank them enough for putting me right on the map. I mean, yeah, expanding on the idea of obviously playing to your strengths. I mean, one thing that I find quite interesting personally from the other interviews that we've done on this podcast is how, the manager sort of man manages like the players like some people like prefer to be fit to feel as the main man the others feel that you know they should constantly improve and they shouldn't be the main man I mean how how do you feel mentally that managers got the best out of you especially at that time yeah J John's faith in me was was something really special really really special you know he would he would be tough at the right time but he had he had some serious faith in me, and I he, he used to give me little comments uh, like um, you know I, I'd, I'd I'd go over my ankle and say oh God I was panicking then, and he'd say oh you were panicking what would I do without you you know just to me not in front of any other lads but that made you feel a million dollars you know and then uh, he he 
he would he would be hard on us. He would be hard on us and, and make us all deliver. But he, uh, he, he, yeah, he made me feel like I could take on any any fullback, anyone, and he'd tell me that, and he'd, he'd show me clips, individual clips again, that um, things that I do now with my players, you know, and, and go through, um, just make me feel great and show me what I was doing and say, look, you've done it. Why can't you keep doing this? Keep doing this to these people. You're killing them. So it was a it was a real good experience of uh, and my management, yeah, John. John was good. He gets he gets knocked actually from a few players because I think you had to be a real tough, mentally strong character to deal with John Beck. He was doing ice baths and cold showers, and but we were eating after training. The, the nights out were brilliant. He was he was beyond. He was he was definitely before his time. He he, he was uh, in the sports science and everything in the early days. But um, my management, yeah, I learned a lot from him. Yeah, you know I mean, this is a great stat we found, found as well in our research. So in 2007, Lincoln fans voted you fourth out of 100 all-time club legends. I mean, what's your reaction to that? It must make you so proud. No, yeah, really proud, you know. Really, and, and like I say, I'm, I'm, I'm never, I know that this game is not individual. You, you can never do it without your teammates. So everyone who played alongside me counts in that vote because oh, yeah. I had some great supply, you know, um, Phil Stant, legend striker, you, you used to know where I was. He just put me in, and and uh, you know Colin Allside, John Whitney. These are these are names that never get mentioned because they never played at the top level. But they would put the ball in the air where they know. I think fifty goals out of my career. I think I scored over a hundred in my career, and fifty have been headers because they knew that I had a great spring. I, I could, and and so all, all, you know, it's great to be in that top top, you know, ten list of legends. Um, but. Um, no, we, we, it's a special place and always will be for, for me, Lincoln City. It's great that they're doing so well at the moment because uh, they went through some tough times recently. Yeah, in 97, Gareth, you joined Port Vale. Um, you won you won an only season with Vale, but you were voted player of the year. Um, what what a season that was for yourself. Yeah, I loved it. You know, that was, that was when the championship became something special, James. You know, it was like the, the leagues were always just the leagues and then all of a sudden you had this Premier League and this championship in, in the mid 90s and it was it became you know you had the fireworks on the TV and, and all that this in the in the in the top league and then the championship was this you know it was it was just a great league to play in and Port Vale were a small club obviously uh, again a great manager in John Rudge uh, who took me in um, I remember scoring in my home debut against Bury and and real 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 Good times playing against some real good players. Um, they'd had a good history of selling players on as well. Robbie Earl and, and Mark Bright, you know, had gone from Port Vale, and and so they, these were big names in the in the Premier League. Steve Guppy had left, left not be long before me, so some some real some real opportunities then to make the next step. But I needed Port Vale. I, I, you know, everyone was talking when I was at Lincoln. I think West Ham were interested. Um, never came to fruition, but. I think if it had gone straight away, it may have been too much, but Port Vale was a great stepping stone for me. And uh, like you said, I only played one year there, but um, really enjoyed my time. And, uh, and, you know, fond memories of that place. It's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a good club, good people. Um, and uh, even played a charity game with Robbie Williams once as well. He's a big Port Vale fan. So that's one of my highlights there as well. But it is. Um, I mean, yeah, you moved, to, you moved on to Premier League side. Wimbledon as they were as they were as they were in ninety eight um, for, for two million. How did how did that move come about? Um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, Port Vale were fly, flying, and in that summer, so I went in uh, in the ninety seven when the ninety seven season came to an end. Um, in the summer, there was loads of talk about Leeds, Tottenham. Um, Wimbledon, uh, Wimbledon were quite under the radar a little bit, but uh, Leeds and Tottenham were quite open that they were they were looking at signing me as well. I remember George Graham come to a game. I think he was at Spurs at the time, and 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 so there was a lot of press around it, and it was great. I really I really enjoyed it. I thrived off being the main man, and 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 really again from carrying on from Lincoln, felt I could. I was so fit. I remember the bleep test one preseason and smashing everyone. And I never used to do that. I, w- I was not the fittest, but just at that period, you got me right on the hot street, right on the purple patch. And yeah. and uh, and I thank John for it, John Beck, John Rudge. Then got me prepared. We played a different style of football. And um, and yeah, he, he said to me, John Rudge said to me, "Look, I can't, I can't not accept this money." He said, "This is this means so much to Port Bell. We have to sell you." And uh, 
and Wimbledon, um, and I think Fulham as well. Kevin Keegan was at Fulham, and Kevin was the England manager as well. So that was a big, big thing. Do I go to Fulham? They were they were actually the league below Port Vale. Um, you remember um, the big takeover they had, and, and I think it was Al Fayed or whatever, and, and they were they were poised for big things. So uh, there was a lot of decisions in the head, but Wimbledon came up with the money. Uh, the rec- it was a record signing at the time, and then John Hartson came a few months later and smashed that out of the water. But it was uh, it was good. The, the 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 story about that one now is that I've, I tell to a few people is uh, I've got a 13 year old son and and he's uh, he's onto his FIFA and all that, and he loves he loves all that sort of stuff. So I remember saying to him once, so, uh, his name's Kane, and I said, Kane, uh, I, w- I was sold once for two million pounds. <laughs> And he says, you must have been rubbish, Dad, because two million pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so I say, yeah, but it, it's a, it wouldn't be a lot back then, but he, uh, he, can't, he can't make the differential. So I mean, in his eyes, I, I wasn't that good a player, but, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll always remember the, uh, the move to the Premier League, special for me. I mean, we'll step away from football a little bit now, Gareth, because you'll probably enjoy this. Um, obviously, during your career, you were named, or you picked up the nickname Wild Thing um, and, and, and was in a band Correct if I'm wrong, you was in a band called APA with Chris Perry and Troy yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, tell us, tell us a little bit about, mu- uh, about your music. Yeah, music's big in our life. You know, mum was a professional singer growing up, so we, all, we always had music around the house. Uh, she used to sing in the big bands around the Northwest. And, uh, and I was down in that, in that sort of area of singing and all the time. Um, so when I got to Wimbledon, um, Trond Anderson, the Norwegian international, was a guitarist, quite a quite a, an, an inclusive person. He would, he would be um, on his own a lot, but we, we became real good friends because of the music. We had the same taste, big Guns and Roses fans and, and rock fans and there. And then uh, Chris Perry played the drums. So we got together and we, uh, we formed a band called APA and we played at the Christmas Do. Uh, and I think we played at um, the Half Moon in Putney, which is a famous pub to play in, in at the end of one season. Only a couple of gigs, but we used to rehearse a lot and write our own stuff. We've still got some of the stuff. We wrote a couple of songs and recorded them in some studios. Um, and, and yeah, real proud moments. So uh, good, good people. And, uh, and that was the kickoff then of, the, of combining the two, you know, the music and the football. So uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty special. And, uh, and that, that started me off on wanting to be in bands again and wanting to get that going. So uh, yeah, good, good times. Uh, we got a bit of abuse at the Christmas day, but the lads don't know that music, believe me. <laughs> Obviously, Wimbledon, Wimbledon being a massive club at the time, yeah. um, was it was it kind of frustrating that you never really because you had a quite a lot, you had quite a few injuries during your time at Wimbledon, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. Um, was it quite frustrating that you never really it never really kicked off for you at Wimbledon? Uh, yeah, really. You know, it's not a regret. Uh, it's probably a wish rather than a regret because I don't regret anything. You know, it's made me who I am. But the wish would have been. You know, I played about 300 games non-stop and, and we signed at Wimbledon. I, I remember playing about four games and then having these pains in me, in my groins. And, and I thought, I've just signed for £2 million and, and, and I've got these pains. And, and I remember playing on a couple more games and then I just couldn't. I played at Chelsea up front once and we played Arsenal. So all these big teams and I was playing through a bit of pain. Eventually I had to stop and, and I'd, I'd done some, a bit of damage, you know, and, and uh, I'd, I'd, I'd a double hernia and, uh, and and this pelvis thing that people suffer from nowadays, overload syndrome. And, and do you know, really, it kept me out for a year. I came back, I, I think I'd, I chipped a bone in my ankle. Um, and, you know, in the, two, in the four years I was at Wimbledon, I think I was only fit for about 18 months, re- being totally honest. And, uh, and we got relegated without me making contribution. I scored two goals at Newcastle in the Premier League, which is probably my finest achievements you know as a player 68,000 at St James's Park you know two goals to to equalize 3-3 three, three. um I think Shearer had scored and Rude Hullett was the manager so some some real special times but few and far between and uh, and yeah one wish is that me uh maybe I had have a bit more sense and stop playing when I first felt things or or they never come at all because I was I, I believe I, I was flying and I could have played well against anyone you know and uh, just unfortunately it never happened for me at Wimbledon in the Premier League and uh, but that's that was my path and I had to move on at the end of that contract and a couple of decent long spells well, one back to Preston uh, which again was brilliant to go back and scored there at Deepdale on the grass in front of 
a brand new stadium and a whole change to that club, which was fabulous. And uh, and uh, I won at Walsall as well, which was championships. You know, scored another goal at Nottingham Forest. I remember a good header. And uh, and so I still had my moments, but yeah, just gutted. I never really turned it on at Wimbledon like I knew I could um, and moved on right at the end when Wimbledon was sort of disbanding and there was all chaos. And I think Milton Keynes went one way and AFC Wimbledon yeah. came out the flames the other way. I got out of that and in March I went to Cardiff <laughs> City and uh, and that was nice because that was a you know and again a fresh start a big club and uh, and we got promoted at the end of that season ironically against QPR but um yeah Wimbledon was a bit of a bit of a tough cookie for me um yeah no worries to me. you know we can't look back we just look forward now but uh, I'm sure I would have been out in that Premier League a bit more I mean yeah you say there it was quite tough at Wimbledon but Obviously, being the two million pound signing and then suffering a few injuries, would you say at your time at the club you were quite well supported by those around you? Definitely, you know, without a doubt. Um, we were this club again, a, a really small club in the Premier League. You know, I signed there and we, we trained at a place called um, Richards and Evans playing fields off the A3 down in uh, sort of New Mould and Roehampton area. And then um, and I turned up on my first day. It was like a transport cafe, honestly. It, was, it wasn't it was like, they're thinking, this is Premier League. This is going to be whistles and bells and everything. And it wasn't. And it was great. You know, Joe Kinnear was manager. Um, it was it was the right club at the right time for me. And they supported me through it. You know, they could have easily have, uh, have really treated me bad. They spent a lot of money on me, you know. Like I say, John Hartson walked through the door about six weeks later for seven and a half million pounds. So they were really going for it then. Uh, played with some good players met some some great people um and you know it, it was it was great to be in the premier league but um unfortunately didn't didn't produce what i wanted to produce there and uh you know it'd be nice to turn the clock back but uh like i said don't want to look back want to look forward and, uh, and crack on made me again part of the person i am today i mean yeah i mean wimbledon sometimes they they have been referred to as the crazy gang would you say you have any stories that reflect that yeah definitely you know there's there's, there's a lot there's some I can tell. There's a lot I can't tell. So, <laughs> and thank God, video phones weren't invented back then. But um, we, uh, I remember my first day, you know, training, and and all, about six players cried off injured, and I'm thinking we, we're not going to have a team for Saturday. And and little did I know they'd all cried off injured to go in the dressing room and set fire to my clothes and cut them up. And and uh, so on my first day, you know, I, I turned up in these clothes and they set, I think they set fire to my jeans, cut all my shirt up, and cut my trainers up and everything. And and there was no way, you know. And then up at Newcastle, we trained. Um, this is not the game I scored to. This is another game, one of the, my early games that I, we, we went up. We, we trained up in Newcastle on the bus. So we got off the bus at Newcastle in this local park. We all did the training session. Um, and then I just remember the lads all like crowding together like a group. And I'm looking over and I'm thinking, this isn't good because I know what they're doing. They're plotting here. And all of a sudden, it was like a pack of hyenas just running at me, honestly. And I was quick, but. People like Ben Thatcher and, and Marcus Gale, you know, they were quick as well. And they got me, ripped all my clothes off, ran back to the bus and left me in the Newcastle Public Park Starkers and they drove off in the bus. So I am to get back to the hotel. Absolutely. Bollock off. You know what I mean? It was, it was great times. Uh, and, and it was a great introduction to those people. But they, they were no mercy. If they see weakness, I tell you, they would, they would exploit it. But um, wow. like I said, Luckily, Hart's, Hart's signed later and he was the butt of the jokes then. Uh, so it was okay. I mean, yeah, you had a loan spell at your old club, Pre Preston, as well. Was yeah. was that just simply to get games? Yeah, yeah, they needed a right winger. Uh, <laughs> just simply to get games. And, uh, you know, my, my, my days were... Joby McEnough was coming through at, at Wimbledon. You know, he, he, he made the right wing places on. Fantastic lad, great player. You know, some real good players coming through at Wimbledon, the young lads at Mikel Ledgett Wood and, and Patrick Adjumang, you know, all these players were coming through. And I was I was thinking, you know, I'm probably about 30 now. And uh, and and so getting games at a championship club again, Preston North End, you know, I went there, really enjoyed it. Uh, Moisey had just left. Um, and, uh, and yeah, get played some Graham Alexander and, and, you know, Sean Gregan. So some good names there as well. We played, played a few games, just missed out on the playoffs. Um, like I said, and then went to Cardiff, which Craig Brown actually came down. He was going to be the new manager of Preston. I had a contract sort of, but he, he didn't see me and his plans at the end of that season. Um, I think the caretaker, Callum O'Hanlon, did. Craig Brown came down and said no, and that was me off again on a journey. So, um, 
yeah, to uh, to Cardiff City, which again, Sam Haman, the owner of Wimbledon. I don't know if you remember Sam Haman. He was head yeah. of the crew gang, you know, the directors, and and he he bought Cardiff, put money into Cardiff, so he took me there, and uh, yeah, good time. Robert Earnshaw, you know, Spencer Pryor, some Graham Cavanagh, some real good names at Cardiff, and we we had a good promotion as well into the championship. So, you know, good good times there as well, and that. The team we beat, obviously, in the final at Millennium Stadium, I ended up signing for, and probably <laughs> the team I know, I'm known best for now, you know, QPR, which, again, yeah. after all that, who'd have known I'd gone to seven great years at QPR as well. I love I loved QPR, and that was a... Um, I mean, yeah, over the course of your time um, at Wimbledon, obviously, you sort of edging towards uncertainty, transferring, to, you know, towards being MK Dons. How was that like to deal with as a player, and did that impact you much at all in, yeah. in you know, just your day-to-day? Tough, you know, it was tough, Jacob. It was. It was. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty around the club. It was. Um, we had Norwegian owners, so Sam Herman had sold the club to Norwegians, uh, and I don't know on what premise, but I don't think they were happy with the deal. It transpires. I don't think they were happy at all with the deal, and uh, and getting relegated from the Premier League really hurt those guys. You know, really did. I mean, it's a, it's a huge thing that, uh, and yeah. you could feel the tension between the board you know and and the staff and and it wasn't it wasn't a it wasn't the, the team that I'd signed for you know it was it was a little bit disjointed by then and uh and you know the the, the rule was that they 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 moved to MK Dons you know um I've never made a judgment on that rule um you know I always I say that the team I played for is he's probably gone now Wimbledon uh AFC's as close as they'll get um, and I'm glad that they've got the crest of the FA Cup winning team. You know, it, it is almost the Wimbledon I played for. Uh, and MK is a team that obviously just just formed at a place in the league, and and they took advantage of that. I don't think I don't think it'll happen again. But um, you know, Wimbledon was a strange time when they were transferring up to MK and everything. It was a, it was probably the right decision to me to get out of that and go to Cardiff. I mean, yes. Yeah, so then following that, you had moves to Walsall and Cardiff. I mean, during that period, would you say, I mean, was it frustrating not really settling at a club for an extended period of time? Yeah, it was, you know, and it was due to the injury, you know, that I'd, 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 got, I'd, I'd, I'd done all that hard work to put myself back on the map um, and be this, this hot property that people wanted in the Premier League. And within two years probably forgotten again you know and, and people were questioning how fit I was and uh, I was uh, I was getting a bit of a sick knot tag you know so um, I had to build up again you know so that the moves to Preston the moves to Walsall and Cardiff were all for me to get me confidence back play games again and it was almost like the start of my career and I've gone sort of Northwich Preston Cambridge Preston you know it, it was sort of right you've got to go on on to Preston go on on to Walsall play a six, six months at Cardiff you know um but luckily, I got myself back on the map, and uh, Ian Holloway always says that he signed me at Wimble, uh, He signed me at QPR for, after what I did to uh, to his teams while I was at Cardiff, you know. So he he remembers, and so it worked. I put my name back on the map, and uh, and I'm glad because QPR was a huge club. I think they'd they'd shown interest earlier in my career, but to sign for that club, you know, I, I thought was a was a real big thing because it's. I mean, famous club, and everyone knows what QPR stands for in football. So it was a, it was a, it was a nice, nice move, and uh, spent some some real good times there as well. I think that perfectly relates to what you said earlier, Gareth. That you often have the conversation with your players now when you are going to release them, um, because it's yeah. obviously in the best interests of them, and you want to make their career better. Obviously, the fact the fact is is that players nowadays can quite easily sit on the bench and just happily take whatever whatever they that they are on. But obviously yeah. what you what you did was you went and you went and thought, no, I'm not gonna go and do that. I'm gonna go and put myself back on the map on the low on the loan market and I'm gonna go and get a next move. It's so important, even nowadays, isn't it, is that players, instead of sitting on a bench and, and not playing football, go and take a move at kind of any level that their ability deserves. Yeah. And go and get yourself back on the mat to get your career going again. Yeah, for me, James, it's always been about the the experience and and the and and the emotions that you feel. And and I'm, I wouldn't be one just to sit around. I think you can't 
sometimes the, the contracts that teams hand out are, are the cause of this as well. You know, it's a little bit, and I think clubs have got to be very careful, especially with what's happened with the current global situation and what, what we're going to come out into. I don't think as bigger and as comfortable contracts are going to be given out. So I'm hoping that there is positives in that where players will have to earn their, in their crust, you know, and you don't get all these sat doing nothing and sitting on the bench and being happy about it. I would never be like that. And I think as a manager, I've got to work out which players are happy with that. And those players aren't for me, you know? And, uh, and yeah, I think I was always, I'm always, even now I'm always a, a doer. I always say that to, to people. I'm always a doer. I'll get up and do it. I'll, I'll go, I won't wait for it to happen. You know, you've got to get up and do it and make it happen yourself. I'm a big believer in that. And, uh, and I think I'm lucky just to have that drilled into me from a young boy you know my dad was always out working and always making things happen and always saying right you've got to you you in charge of your own path you know and, and I think that's uh that's a big thing uh like I say as a manager I want my players to go right I want to play I'm not happy sitting on the bench I want to have them chats with them about why they're not playing and, and I'll always talk to them uh, and I think that's uh that's a big thing in football um managers talking to players I think especially now with all the all the mental health issues and, and talking for me is huge and I'll never shy away from that uh, and so yeah yeah I think players making their own path doing it getting up and doing it for themselves is really important you certainly did in 2003 like you say you went and signed for QPR you made quite an entrance didn't you Gareth you you, you went and scored five goals in in four games and achieved promotion as well in that yeah. first first season when you were there quite an entrance yeah it was nice you know <laughs> Blackpool at home on the first day of the season. I remember the build-up for that season. Ollie had been, we'd been to an army camp. We were super fit. We'd played, um, I think, Aylesbury in the pre-season friendly and a couple of other teams pre-season. But the big one was Blackpool. You know, they were they were fancied. Obviously, they were they were a decent side. But QPR had been in the playoff final the year before against Cardiff, um, and so that we were probably favourites for the league that season. So there was a bit of pressure on us. Um, but some real good players, you know, Kevin Gallen, um, Martin Rowlands, Danny Shittu, Clark Carlisle, you know, some real, real good players in that side that I, I went into. And, uh, and yeah, I scored two goals on my debut at, um, at Loftus Road. You know, one, one was very debatable whether it's mine or not, but I ran off claiming it. And, uh, and that's, that's in the record books as mine. I think the keeper helped me put it in. Um, but the second one in front of the loft, you know, dreams dreams are made of. You know, I, I think a one-two with Paul Furlong and uh, just sneaked it under the keeper right in front of the loft, ran to the fans, which I didn't know where the noisy fans were, but apparently where I ran to is where all the nutcases are week in, week out, and that's the noisiest place. And so yeah. I sort of had this instant rapport and, uh, and yeah, real, real good games, um, you know, early, early on in the season. Rushton and Diamonds always known for the two goals I scored there. I scored a volley from sort of 40 yards or maybe 45 next week and then 50 the week after. Right? It was uh, it was definitely from a, a good range. Um, and, you know, just felt again like I was back and, and like I could I could make this mark. And uh, like I said, play with some fantastic players, a great manager, Ian Holloway. Let us, let the energy flow and let the energy feed out of that dressing room. He was very good at that. You know, he could have easily come down on us sometimes, but he, he knew that, the energy in that dressing room was what got us promoted and uh, and he let it flow. Um, yeah, real good times. So yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned the you mentioned the names there, Gareth. Like reeled off the reeled off those yeah wonderful pros um, yeah. that they are. Did you always know when you walked into that dressing room that that was going to be a successful side? Uh, do you know what? I I knew we had a special side. Yeah, you looked around. You looked. Danny Shitu was was. Coming into his prime, where you knew he was, he was such a massive size. You knew he was going on to big things. You know, um, Clark Carlisle, the intelligent one. You know, very, very, very clever, and 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 knew the organisation of the place. I mean, Paul Furlong and Kevin Gallon up front. Just, I honestly say that that team now would would still compete in the championship today. You know, we we really had a decent side, um, wow. and you know, later on we brought Lee Camping goal and. Um, Richard Edshill came from Man City, so there was there was some some real talent. Um, yeah, real real place to be a part of that that squad and that that um, Martin Rollins, one of my my close friends, you know, still today. So um, yeah, we, we, we're really uh, really close. Mark Birch and of course some some names that will just go down and keep your folklore. And uh, yeah, real 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 special times. 
I mean, you only play 23 times the following campaign, um, down to injury, but yeah. I just mentioned him there, Ian Holloway. He still offered you a contract that year, stating that you were an important player. That support during the injury, injured times, still be offered a contract, must yeah. have been vital for you. Yeah, and that's the game, you know, I think managers seeing what the value of people, I, I do it now, the value of people around the place, not just on the pitch. And I think it's it's undervalued sometimes what people give around the place. You know, you can, if you have the right people around your dressing room or, or your club, you can save yourself a, a whole heap of trouble if your dressing room can get out of hand. You, I have a, I have four generals at Wickham. Um, Akin Fenn was one of them. Um, Bloomfield, Jacobson, you know, they're, 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 they're called the generals and, and they'll keep things that they are brilliant for me. They are me in the dressing room. I don't need to be in that dressing room all the time. I don't need to be constantly looking around the corner, looking over my shoulder. I trust these guys so much that they are me in that dressing room. They know what I want and they'll implement it in their ways, you know. And, and I think Ian, I was in a way one of Ian's generals, you know, and, and we didn't have the terms then, but me, Kevin Gallen, Mark Birch and Martin Rollins, we, we were sort of the energy of the group. And I think he knew that splitting that up would have been would have been quite a, a difficult thing and uh and we you know we'd always be there for people we'd, always, we'd be there on the night side we'd be there on the pitch for the lads we'd be the energy and uh and i think that ian was very smart in, in recruiting what he did and uh and I'm, i mean i'm glad he kept hold of me because uh i i had got an injury that season i remember going to volley a ball and and somebody put their studs up and i volleyed their studs and i broke my foot and uh and that kept me out for quite a considerable amount of time but um, again, thank Ian Holloway for you know, part, part the, the part he played in my career as well because he's uh, he's been a fantastic friend since then. Yeah. Yeah. Do you use Ollie uh, in in terms of management skills that he had? Do you uh, have you taken from him and used it for for, for yourself? Yeah. So I think all my managers have I've taken things from. You know, Ollie was very. He, he lives on emotion, Ollie. You know, I really do. Some of his team talks were really from the heart. You know, sometimes tactics wouldn't even be ten percent of it. It'd be the emotional connection they had with us, with the game, with how he, how well he, and how proud he was of us. And uh, I remember we got promoted at Sheffield Wednesday at the end of that season. And uh, one of his master strokes was he got the fans in to give us the team talk um, at the hotel, and uh, and it. It wasn't the ones who were shouting, going, come on, come on, we can do it today. It was the one guy that said, I've supported this club for 20 years and, and um, no matter what happens today, I'm, I'm coming next season because you lot make me proud. Wow. Ollie said, Ollie said, that's the one. That's that's the team talk you take on to the pitch today. That guy there. And and we all went, you know, that's like a master stroke. That's all we needed. And we went out, we won 3-1, we got promoted. And uh, I'd say, even if we hadn't have been, that guy would have been there. And he, and he was... It was just a real good. We'd heard Ollie forty-five times that season, just to do that, and it was a brave thing to do on that last game. But he uh, he he got it spot on. I mean, yeah, during that two thousand six two thousand seven season, you actually had your season ended early in April because of a broken leg against Luton. I mean, yeah. how on earth did you sustain that? Yeah, I tried to run it off as well, which is the worst thing. So I, uh, I always get, go down and keep the off fans. I was there when you tried to run your broken leg off. But uh, I went up for a header with... Um, it was the big game, actually. We needed to win it to sort of survive. Uh, John Gregory was the manager. He'd come in uh, after Gary Waddock. And, uh, and I went up for a challenge uh, header with a centre-half. I always used to go for the headers, compete with the headers. I used to get some good spring. And as I was coming down, our, our legs got twisted. And this big centre-half sort of snapped my leg on the way down as we landed. It was quite nasty, yeah. So and I felt the bone go. Uh, and I knew as soon as I got up to try and run, there was a clicking sensation in my leg. And I, I just knew that it had gone. Um, and I think uh, I tried to side foot a throwing back and, and I was in immense pain. It wasn't the foot I'd kick with, but the foot I tried to stand on, that was the broken leg. And, uh, and that, was, that was a real killer. And Adam Boulder just came over the midfield of that and said, Gaz, Get down! You you not look you don't look right. So I went, you know, found out that was a that was a break. It was a major, major break, but um, but uh, we won the game. I remember going to uh, I can't remember what hospital it was now. It was in one in North London, and getting it was in the first half. I broke my leg, 
got to the hospital, got it cast up and got back just as the final whistle was going and we won 3-2. So I joined in the celebrations with a cast on my leg in the dressing room after. There's not many can say they've done that. But uh, that, was, uh, that was tough, yeah. Um, tough to take. But again, John Gregory put total faith in me. I got a letter at the end of that season saying, I want you here next year. You're part of my plans. And so, you know, fantastic at probably about... 32, 33 years old, you know, John was, uh, John was backing me even with a broken leg and that, uh, oh, don't, don't forget things like that. I mean, yeah, that season afterwards, you ended up assisting new manager Luigi Di Canio. Did injuries oh, yeah. play a part in you wanting to think of other roles within football that you might want to adopt in future? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, no. Um, injuries did play a part in that because I wanted to be a physio at one stage. When I went through my hell at Wimbledon, I was looking down the physio route. I had a guy called wow. Steve Allen at Wimbledon, and he was, yeah, he was, he was trying to get me in the physio route, and I was doing the exams. But then when Luigi came in, it was more, it more in luck than anything because I, I can speak Spanish. My my wife's from Venezuela, so I learned Spanish like you do when you're trying to impress a girl. You try and. <laughs> In the early days, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, no, we can. I, I can speak um, seventy percent Spanish, so Italian and Spanish are very close. So when Luigi was trying to put his sessions on, he would he would turn to me and say, "Gaz," and I I would say it in English what he was trying to say, and, and I'm sure I got some wrong, but I'm sure I got some right. And he at the end of that season, he he, he left uh, Luigi, went back to Italy. And, but as he left, he said, Gaz, take your badges. He said, the lads respect you. You know what you're saying. Um, you, you're a leader. Take your badges. So he saw in me the, the management side of things. But I wasn't really ready to be a manager. Um, although the next season, I was caretaker twice. Because <laughs> yeah, Flavio Briatore came into the club and started sacking managers left, right and centre. And I was the one picking up the pieces. So two spells of caretaker were, uh, were, were coming up the next season. Well, yeah, I mean, as you were alluding to, I mean, first off, you ended up taking up a player coach role under Ian Dowie. I mean, yeah. was that, what, what was that experience like under Ian? Ian was a great, great guy, real good manager. You know, I think we were fifth in the league when he, he got relieved of his duties. But uh, I think he was a, a very, uh, he knew what he wanted. He, he had it in his mind what he wanted and he didn't want to change really for for anything and I think him and Flavio really clashed a little bit on that um and Flavio just uh wasn't he, he didn't really know about football too much you know it was very early days for him as well and, and I, I don't know if he knew what the what the consequences were of sacking managers but he he sacked him and then he's he's he said we pick up the pieces like uh, and, I, and I said well I'll have to there's no one else you know so um, I took over for I think five games after Ian went, and then uh, we had some good results. Uh, we had some some losses, but I think the second game at home was Birmingham, and and we had a one 0 win, which was fabulous. You know, real good moments. Um, but then he brought in Paulo Souza, and again to learn off it, it was perfect for me for my time of career. Thinking I may want to be a coach. First, I had Ian Dowie to learn off. Then I've got Paolo Souza, who, for me, still is is one of the best managers I, I, I've I've worked with. You know, I, even wow, that the, is a statement. Uh, one of the short times he was there, he introduced me to the word transition, to the to the different stages of the game. Um, you know, I had all these, I had all these English managers, which was fantastic. Paolo's probably opened a different part of my brain up to see it a little bit differently. Um, and and it was uh, it was different, uh, and and you know Paolo didn't last long again. Flavio had his thing, and uh, and and I picked up the pieces for I think the remaining four games of the season. But I knew then that I'd learnt enough to whet my appetite to to do these badges to start learning about the game, and uh, and I'm coming up about 36, 37 years old now. Um, but do you know what? Because I hadn't played much that season, I still felt fit and I still felt I had something to offer on the pitch. Hence why the season, the next season, I, I told Flavio I'd, I wasn't ready to be manager. He brought Jim Magilton in. Um, and I think that probably ended my days at QPR then. Uh, you don't really upset yeah. Flavio too much. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, 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 at Christmas time, uh, I went on loan. I think there'd been 
honestly, I think he sacked Jim McGillan. Paul Hart came in. He went. Mick Harford came in. Remember and that. under Mick, I went to um, I went to Wickham on loan and uh, came back for two weeks, but then went back and signed permanently in the January two thousand and ten. And and yeah, that's, that's my longest club so far. That's ten years now being there, and uh, it's it's been an enjoyable time there as well. I mean, yeah, at QPR, obviously, Ian was sacked in the October of that season, yeah. where you then became caretaker manager for a bit. You managed a game against Man United, which you run them very close. Yeah. How, how was that as an experience? And also, did you learn anything during that time that you still take into your you know, day-to-day as a manager nowadays? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, do you know what? Being totally honest at QPR, I didn't really take the team and put my stamp on it. That's being totally honest. I, I, I just took over as a caretaker and just status quo almost. Let things just be how they were. Don't change the team too much. Don't mess about too much. Um, not, not brilliant work on opposition. Just almost, almost just took the reins and kept the horse going, you know, and that was what I did. So for me, that was learning. Next time I take over, Make sure you make a difference, you know, and uh, and you know, put your stamp on things and and be that person that you are, you know. And uh, and I was I was lucky to get another chance at Wickham, but um, no, nah, QPR, I wasn't I wasn't ready to be a manager. I still wanted to play, uh, and uh, and that was a big decision to make, a real big decision because I could have maybe pushed myself to be QPR manager, but it wouldn't have been fair, not on the team and the fans and and. And you know, I probably wouldn't have been fair to myself because I wasn't ready. And uh, the stint at Wickham playing before then getting a the manager's job was definitely needed. Yeah, I mean, you just alluded to it to it there, Gareth, that you obviously joined Wickham on that one one, one month loan deal. But there was there was rumours before that Lincoln were Lincoln were kind of sniffing around for you, for you to be for you to be manager. Um, you obviously alluded to it there, saying that you weren't you weren't ready. Was it was it the case that you just wanted to to carry on playing as long as long as you could, and then then step into in, into management properly? Yeah, I felt I felt I had even at thirty seven. I felt I had I had some good years left in me. I, I felt in a strange way that the years I lost at Wimbledon, I felt that I would get these back on the other end of my career, and and, and I did. You know, I kept myself really fit. One of my one of my biggest things was being fit in there when I was. So I was never a the most skillful person in the world. You know, I, I would get the ball, get past someone, get a crossing, get on the back stick, work my socks off, track back. So I needed to be fit to do that. So I always kept myself super fit. Even today, I, you know, I still keep fit. Every morning is, is still a big, you know, it's a big thing for me to, to get your body going. Your mind will always follow on that. And so uh, Lincoln really, you know, there was a phone call, I think, but um, again, I wasn't ready. I think Chris Sutton actually took over. Um, I think they uh, they were in a pretty tough place as well. You know, I think they they were financially in a in a in a tough place. And again, it would have been a real challenge for my first job. And uh, and so going to Wickham to play was definitely the right decision. Yeah, I mean, you did, you did, yeah, you did go, to, you did go to Wickham, obviously on the one month loan deal. Um, you, you suffered relegation at the end of that season. Um, for, for Wickham, was that was that t- tough to take? Yeah, not as tough as. As you'd think, because I was actually, you know, we were bottom of the league when I when I signed. I yeah. got a slight calf injury, missed missed. The, I think I played about fourteen, fifteen games, and we and we we almost did it. We almost stayed up on that last last day of the season. Uh, um, obviously, you reminded you earlier of the the last game of that season was Gillingham. Yeah, at, at Gareth. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and both of us got relegated, but um, but. It was uh, it. What it didn't hit me as hard. It didn't hit me like a massive thing. I, I, I thought the season after I'd signed a two-year deal, the season after would be the one. Um, we had a guy called Adam Hinchelwood who, who unfortunately ended his career in that 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 relegation season right then. And I took the captain's armband with about four games to go. Uh, and I thought to myself then, you know, next season we're going to be strong here. And uh, and we did get relegated, but the season after, luckily we went back up. Um, and I was captain that season. I think I scored ten goals, I think, from midfield that year, and uh, and and led the team to promotion, which was a real one of the one. You know, all all the things, all the places I played and the leagues I played in, that promotion from League Two as captain that was special for me at Wickham Wanderers as well. At thirty-eight years old, I think I was then, and uh, 
And so, yeah, some real good times came from that. Um, but um, again, unfortunately, down again the next season. And uh, but again, that 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 brings me on to management and where I am today. I mean, yeah, I mean, at the beginning of your time at Wickham under Gary Wadduck, obviously you got relegated, like you said, then promoted. Was it easy at the time for for Gary to reassure you that you know there was security and we like we are going to bounce back the season after getting relegated? Uh, yeah, Gary was a, Gary was a real calm manager, real calm. Um, never never lost it. He had a he had assistants that always were tougher, you know. But Gary was quite a quite a thinker, uh, and again, I think I take something from Gary. He was uh, very methodical in what he did. Really good coach on the ball. Um, yeah, he had this confidence of him. He never lost it. So you'd never, you'd never see any any flaws in Gary. You know, he always had this confidence that he he would be doing the right thing, and uh, and he did. He picked the right team that season because we, you know, we we got promoted, and uh, and I'm glad we did because Gary, you know, had a tough tough first season really getting relegated when uh, he'd, he'd inherited someone else's team, um, and and that was uh, that was nice for Gary. But yeah, real calm. And still speak to him today. Really, really, really good friend. Uh, and uh, and like I say I can't thank him enough for where I am today. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that story of Gary, Gary Waddock, I mean, that is a really good sort of example for clubs actually sticking by their managers. Because another club at another time, you know, if he gets relegated, he could have easily gone. But actually, sticking by him, you know, it bears some fruit by the end of it. Yeah, and we had a chairman called Steve Hayes, and and he he stuck by Gary, and and that was rightly so. You know, I was captain, and uh, you know, he, he not once did he ring me up and questioning Gary. He always rang me up and said, "How can we help Gary?" You know, and and so uh, I think you know when Steve sold the club then to the trust, it was the trust who got rid of Gary after his first eight games of of the season after we'd been relegated again back to League Two, and. Uh, and that was tough, um, but yeah, it was a great, great show of faith from Steve to keep with Gary, and I think he uh, he definitely got some reward from that. I mean, yeah, that season that you did get promoted, you finished a single point above Shrewsbury. I mean, what were those final weeks of that season like? It must be yeah, there. we 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 win, and and Shrew- I think we, I think out of the last ten games, I think we won eight and drawn two. And Shrewsbury matched us on every single one. And it was incredible that they were stayed with us. Um, you know, and, and it was absolutely incredible. And, and I mean, the, the big talking point that season was I scored a header at Shrewsbury that never crossed the line. Um, it, was, it was crazy. I, I think I scored a, had a header from the edge of the box. Um, the keeper saved it. But I was on the floor and I looked at the linesman and the linesman flagged. So I ran off celebrating and watching it back on the replay. There's no way that crossed the line, and uh, and so I, I got a bit of stick for that. But obviously, I thought it had gone in because he gave it. I think the linesman got absolutely vilified by the Shrewsbury fans. But it's amazing how football throws these things up. And uh, and yeah, I was I was definitely not Shrewsbury's favourite player for uh, for quite a long time. But uh, like for the, they're up in the same division now, and uh, and it's a nice club to be uh, playing against as well. I mean, yeah, like you said, you went on a really great run towards the end of the season. But with the squad that you had, did you feel that you know you had the minerals to go to go up that season? Um, yeah, it was tough. You know, we weren't we probably weren't the best team in the league. Um, you know, uh, it it was tough. I think Berry had, had performed really well, got themselves promoted. Um, we we were you know we were hanging on there, but um, we had some you know we had some experience up front with a. Scott Randell, who scored, I think, 20 goals that season. We had a guy called Ben Strevens as well, who, who uh, came from Brentford. And and, uh, and they made a great partnership. I remember Strevens scoring the couple up at Berry in a real crucial game towards the end. And uh, and and Nicky Bull had a great season. Nice. In goal, you know, Dave Winfield at the back. Some some real good names. Leon Johnson as well. Some some solid experience that we'd had for, uh, throughout the campaign. So... Um, Betsy, Kevin Betsy obviously played at a high level as well so we, we did have the tools when I look at it now in the team but there was some good sides in there that year and, uh, and I just remember that that was a real tense run that right to the end and we played South End on the last game of the season um, had to beat them and they scored first they went 1-0 up um, but we, we finally came out 3-1 winners uh, and, and Scott Rendell had a great season I think he'd, he'd lost he lost a newborn baby that year as well. So for him to overcome that as well, him and his wife, their first child, 
um, went through some wow. complications at birth, you know, and, and Strev, uh, sorry, uh, Scott was a real, real humble guy. So to have gone through what he'd gone through and still be the person he was, you know, it was a real oh. special moment. You know, some things are so much in football, you know, um, and he's a, he's a top lad and uh, he went on to have a real good career, I think. He, he may still be playing at all the shot and be playing older than I did soon, but uh, he's, a, he's a great guy and uh, so some, just keep in touch with a lot of that team as well. Yeah, I mean, like you said just there, obviously, went down to the last game of the season where you beat South Bend 3-1. Just give us sort of like your recollection of how that game panned out at the time and the, and the day as a whole, really. Yeah, I do remember this day, actually, because uh, when it was the last game of the season, the pitch was looking really decent. Um, and I took a, I'd, I'd promised the school, um, my local, my, my, my son's school, I promised them that I'd take them on the pitch last game of the season. So I had this massive game coming up. <laughs> and I had to keep fulfilling this promise that this school from where I live, where I'd take them on the pitch before the game. But if I'm honest, it probably calmed my nerves. It probably gave me something else to concentrate on there. Uh, you know, I was a skipper. I was, I was sort of leading the team out. Um, and I just remember even, I think it was Anthony Grant who scored for um, Southend. Um, and even at 1-0 down, we still felt that we were in control of this game. You know, I think Scott Donnelly scored and Scott Rendell maybe got a couple. Um, but it was, it was always in control. There was never a panic situation. I think that was his, probably Gary on the pitch with us, you know, his calmness. So it felt, felt good. And... Uh, Felt nothing less than we deserved that year, but um, yeah, it was uh, looking back now. It's probably those little moments did help me in uh, not thinking about the game too much. Yeah, I mean, you were out of contracts. You were out of contract at that season, wasn't you, Gareth? And, and I think yeah. the, I think the club at the time had a bit of a shake up where they got rid of kind of the likes of John Paul Pittman, Lewis Montrose, yeah. Alan, yeah. Alan Bennett. Uh, they had a real good shake up. Was it? Was it kind of? Was there ever a fear within yourself that? you might be on the end of that list as well? Um, no, you know, I'd, I'd heard something from Gary. Gary always had me earmarked for a coach with him. Um, so I was confident that you, Gary would stay true to his word. And I always remember it, some really nice words that, um, that Gary and, and Richard Dobson, who's now my assistant manager, he was Gary's assistant yeah. manager. But they, they said that you can't let players like Gareth leave this club. You can't let them go. And that was really nice, not not for the football reason, for the people reason, like I said earlier. And we've got one up yeah. with him now, Matt Bloomfield. You know, you, you can't let these people go. They're so special to the club. And I'm glad I was I was thought of in that sort of way. Um, so I was pleased, you know, and, and I'd had a good career as well. So if it had have ended there, it wasn't a massive worry, but I was just glad that it didn't because the next chapter, obviously at the cost of Gary, um, started yeah. for me. And uh it so I'm so thankful for the people who've kept me when when they needed to. Yeah, I mean that that the following season, unfortunately, ended up in in relegation. Of course, you had Stuart Bevan at the time um, yeah. that that was hitting goals left, right, and centre. Um, Scott, I think he ended up scoring 25 goals that season. You ended up ended up getting relegated. Um, was it's a bit of a shock, isn't it? We, we in terms of. Having it, having a striker that's scoring that many goals, but having a team that ends up getting relegated, it's yeah, yeah, it's a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah, he, he was just, he was a cracking player, Stewie, and he, he was having his his Lincoln spell, shall I call it? Because uh, I, I was any, anything I'd hit would turn to gold at Lincoln, and it looked like that with Bevs, you know, that season. Everything he hit, he, he was sharp as a tack. You know, he'd come from Didcot Town. I think Peter Taylor signed him for pennies, and. Uh, he was really proving his worth and he went on to a good move to Preston North End, you know, which was great for Stu. But um, yeah, really, really strange that you have a striker who scores that many and you get relegated. But uh, obviously it worked for him and uh, yeah, I'm pleased he went on to, uh, to, to get his move because he, he, was, he was outstanding that year. Yeah, I mean, you ended up becoming caretaker manager in, in September 2012 um, of, of, of Wickham. Um, how, how did you find that? In terms of adapting between playing and and caretaking, I think for a while you were playing man player managing, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And was it was it hard not to beat yourself on a team sheet <laughs> every week? Your first oh, name. Yeah, no. Do you know what? <laughs> Honestly, James, I did put myself on the team sheet in the second game because the first game we got beat at Dagenham away three nil, uh, and and it 
I, I don't I don't think like this usually, but I just thought to myself, you know what, I could make an impact here. I can yeah. I can add to, I can offer something. Here. I still felt so fit. You know, I played under Gary in the previous couple of games. Gary needed me as a as a as a winger. Um, he got sacked against AFC Wimbledon at home. I remember the game now. You know, we missed the penalty and and we didn't play well at all. They, they beat us one 0 and that was the end of Gary. But he always said to me. Um, your turn now. He gave me that blessing the day he was sacked. He just said to me, "Guys, this is your turn. Take it. Don't, don't feel guilty on me. Take it." And so that for me was just fabulous advice. You know, for somebody that's the mark of the man. You know, he was a great guy. So I went in uh, and I did change, and, and I didn't want to do what I did at QPR and just go status quo. I went right. If you think you're going to make a difference, guys, put yourself in. So I did. I remember putting myself in against. I think Plymouth was our second game, and Torquay was our third game, and I played in both and. We, we, we lost the first, Dagenham, and I, and I was trying to be this, I'll be the manager. And I thought, sorry, I'm going to play. Um, we've got some ex- inexperienced lads. We've got some lads who are worried. Get in there. And uh, and I think we, we drew against Plymouth and beat Torquay. And I, and I felt I felt great. I, I didn't put it was all in, you, Gareth. <laughs> yeah, I didn't put myself in for the rest of the season. Like, I didn't go right to me every week. But I just thought... I could do more on the pitch. I could steady the ship a bit more on the pitch. You know, yeah. it totally, totally wasn't me, believe me. But I just felt I had more influence on the pitch than off it. Uh, and and still making that transition from player to player to manager. You know, it was uh, it was a tough one to make. But um, you know, I, I kept sort of my cameos going for I think a couple of years, and uh, and I was pleased to do so. You know, I was proud to do so. And and the best thing was none of the lads ever came to me and said, "Oh, you're just picking yourself." And they never said that. They always <laughs> knew that I would I would deliver in some way. You know, not the legs the legs went towards the end, but um, I, I'm hoping that the player the players I did play with never thought that um, I was just picking myself because I could. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, from the outside, it looked like you really took to the management game quite quickly. I mean, December 2012, picked up 10 points from a possible 15. I mean, nominated for Manager of the Month as well. Did those sort of plaudits help give you sort of the, the self-belief that, like you said earlier at QPR, where you've wished you'd put your stamp on the club, that actually you went again and actually you, you did put your stamp on the club this time? Yeah, and it's a crazy, crazy theory I've got on this, is that I did change things at the start. But then I did take my foot off the gas, you know. So I think in the early success, and we finished 13th in that season, and uh, and it was almost like I'd had this injection, I'd, I'd, I'd given this energy to the group. But do you know what? I did take my foot off the gas again. And that summer, I thought I'd probably cracked it. Uh, and that was my huge lesson that I learned. Um, I'd inherited Gary's players. They weren't my players, so my stamp wasn't totally on it. But I'd put a little bit of my stamp on. That's what kept us up. The season after, we almost went out of the football league, and uh, I remember that we played up on the last day of the season. Yeah, Tokyo away, you know, and, and and we had to beat them, and we needed <coughs> Bristol and Northampton to get beat. And you know, for the grace of anything, Bristol got beat. Wouldn't heaven knows how, but they did at home against Mansfield, and uh, and I remember that day, and that's the biggest lesson I've ever had. But looking back to the start of that season, I didn't change enough. I didn't do enough. I I, I wasn't. I was assertive at the start when I took over at Wickham and then I just let it go again. It was almost take the reins again, guys, and I shouldn't have done that. And since then, I've always been changing and, and evolving rather than just letting things flow. I think you've, as a manager, you've always got to be on the pulse. You've always got to be ahead of the curve. And, and I think that, that season definitely taught me that. I mean, yeah, talking about the playing side of things as well, 27th of April 2013, you actually played your final game as an actual like player manager against your former club Port Vale I mean knowing that that was sort of a milestone at the time was that quite an emotional time even yeah. though you knew you were going to stay on in a different capacity yeah that was the end of that first season you know where we finished 13th there was nothing on the game I think Port Vale were promoted we were safe uh, and I always remember my assistant saying not many people and my dad especially said not many people get to choose when they want to retire and, and choose such a good game. And Port Vale was down and it was great, you know, a big reception and everything. And and so it was nice. And, you know, it probably added to me relaxing a little bit that summer, which which, which was the wrong thing to do. But um, it was uh, it was a nice way to finish it. And, and like I say, one of the clubs I've played for um, and still, I think, about two weeks before my 40th birthday was a, was a nice way to do it. Um, I had my little cameo 
couple of years later at Northampton in the Checker Trades Cup. But um, but I was I was really proud to have finished the league campaign against uh, one of the teams that played a big part in my career. Yeah, I mean during those during those years at uh, or during the years at Wickham Gareth, obviously it's been a, a, a poor talented footballers that have, uh, have gone on and, and done, and done fantastic things at, at the highest level just name obviously Jordan I have Courtney House Matt Phillips you can keep you can get reading them off can't you yeah did you ever see like those couple of names there Jordan and Courtney did you see themselves go going and playing at the highest level and, and what were they like as as people as well yeah Jordan definitely you know Jordan uh he was electric when he was young, really, really electric, you know, and you could see that he had this, this natural ability just to, to, just to set the place on fire, you know, taking people on, running at people. He was, he was unbelievable and, and so ahead of his years, you know, such a big physique for such a young boy. And I played in his debut actually when he was 15 and he played and scored against Sheffield Wednesday and there. And so you always knew Jordan would do it. Courtney, a little bit different. He'd, he'd been at Birmingham and at West Ham, and I think Richard Dobson did a job. Uh, Dobson did a fantastic job in getting him to Wickham, uh, and I actually gave him his debut, his league debut. Um, I think he made his debut at left back for me, uh, and, uh, and had a fantastic game. You know, so wow. he's uh, he, he was he, he was somebody that we always knew. He had this stature, Courtney. He just needed to learn just the calmness and how big he was. You know, and and and. But, it, you know, to see these people now playing at such a high level, you know, and, and some of the other ones that have come through the uh, the ranks, you know, you mentioned Matty Phillips um, as a manager, you know, the likes of Eberichi Easy and Alfie Mawson, you know, to, to be going on to to what they'll go on to. It's just it's just the biggest buzz ever as a manager to uh, to, to know that you, you you have some sort of part in their careers. Um, but, um, yeah, we, we always knew there was some special talent at Wickham and... Uh, and unfortunately, the youth team, the academy, got canned a few years ago. Um, but you know, we get some decent loans now, and, and still play a part in in people's careers, which is really important. Yeah, obviously, you mentioned it a minute ago, Gareth, about that about that talky game. I'm, I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure, sure you don't want to talk about it too much. But yeah, what, what that experience there from kind of nearly nearly going out of football league and things like that. What what do you take from then to now in 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 that experience that you would you would totally do differently if you would do anything differently? Yeah, that the season I I I'd inherited a squad um, just like Gary did when you know he inherited Peter. So I, I inherited Gary's squad. The difference was I'd probably played played more of a part in Gary's squad, you know, because I was a coach, but. In that first season, energy kept us up and, and spirit and the change of manager. It could have been probably anyone who would have changed the dynamics of that place. And I didn't notice that. And I, and I should have noticed that. And I should have thought that summer I needed to make some tough decisions and some decisions on some big players that, that I, I personally didn't think were good enough for League Two, uh, but never really made that decision. You know? and, and I think you know, you've got to act on your, your thoughts and you've got to act on your decisions and, and you're not going to be able to please everybody as a manager. So, um, for one season, I tried to please everyone. For one season, I didn't act on what I thought sometimes and, I, and I'd, I'd sweep things under the proverbial carpet and never again. That's uh, that, that was the biggest lesson and the biggest kick up the backside that any manager is ever going to get. And, uh, and I'm glad it came, just like I'm glad that... You know, the releases came early in my career because they made me a tough guy and I had to go and live in Cambridge. I had to stand on my own two feet. I'm glad that day came because since then, fortunately, we've been on an upward curve and uh, and I made some pretty tough decisions and nothing will be as bad as standing on that touchline at Torquay with all the Wiccan fans there and at home all looking at me thinking, if we go down, this could be the end of the Wiccan Wanderers and you were the manager. That's, that was not yeah, a nice wow. place. Leave me, you know. So um, even though there's other factors, um, the club had gone through tough times and we were trust on, there was no money. It was still me in charge, me at the helm, and I didn't want to be the manager known for that. So uh so I made some tough decisions, some big decisions, and made sure I uh, I were, I'm never gonna go back there again. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that game obviously finished 3-0, you ultimately stayed up. 
lack day how did you how did you tackle that occasion did, did you keep an eye on the results or was the message very much we need to focus on ourselves rather than looking at results elsewhere yeah i think i always remember saying we have to get off to a good start boys i want a good start on a fast start i want i want the world knowing that wickham have gone one nil up because if anything's going to put pressure on the other teams it's wickham winning and then the live league table puts us above the other teams all this sort of psychology so um, I always were confident we were going to do it. I don't know why. I don't know why. Maybe it was because I was at absolute rock bottom and there was nothing else. It was either you, you can go off whimpering, which isn't me at all, or you can believe you're going to do this. And I started believing from early in that week. And every time I, I would talk to the boys, it was always about, we're going to do this, we will do this. And that probably, you know, gave me the first look at the psychology side of things and how that can be so important. But um we, uh, yeah, we, we did manage to get it. And for the last 20 minutes, yeah, I was concentrating on the other results. I knew we were 3 0 up. Toki were down. They had no response to us. And uh, I remember uh, Dobbo saying to me, oh, uh, somebody at one of our forwards isn't doing this right. And I'm, I just went, forget that, Dobbo. I, I'm, I'm looking at the press box here because Bristol Rovers are 1 0 down. We could be winning. So <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a surreal moment. But. Hell of a hell of a moment, um, hell of a party on the way home. By the way, if you ever want a good bus journey home from Torquay, that was the one. Um, <laughs> Long uh, old journey. <laughs> yeah, but some big decisions in the summer. Big decisions in the summer. So some of the players that had helped keep me in a job and stay in the league, I had to let them go. I had to let them go and say, "Time for fresh blood. Time for a new team." And that's hard in football. It's hard, but again, big decisions. Um, and if I hadn't made those big decisions, we wouldn't be where we were today. Big decisions, big rewards. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't be in a job, you know. And I think that all the players that I ever have let go and I ever spoke to, they've all said they understand why. They, they, it's football. And, uh, and I think as managers, we, we, we should always know that it's never personal. It's just my opinion. Somebody had an opinion about me a long time ago, and, and they got that wrong. I may get it wrong as well, but I'm, I'm man enough to make those decisions now and, uh, and make sure I'm doing it for the good, good of Wickham. I mean, yeah, that moves us on to that summer. Obviously, you restructured the defence in particular quite a lot, bringing in the likes of John Barty, you obviously brought in Jacobson, Aaron Pierre is another name. I mean, you brought in striker Paul Hayes as well. Would you say that those signings were the biggest factor behind the, the success that then followed that next season? Yeah, I'd say so, Jacob. You know, I think that, that, that I made some good signings uh... I've made some bad signs, but I've done some good signings as well in, in my career as manager. But I think that summer, Hayes, Jacobson, John Barty, Pierre, Mawson, you know, th there was there's some real important names that came in. Alfie was was uh, last minute, you know, got him on loan at last minute because we had an, a, uh, a centre-half emergency. Um, but Hazy, Hazy was uh, somebody I'd seen, I'd worked with before. He'd came a couple of years before, wanted him back. He knew he was so clever for the game. Um, yeah, he was just uh, Peter Murphy I brought in as a midfielder as well from Accrington who always used to score against us I thought rather than score against me he can come and score for me and uh, and so we, we'd we made some real big changes that summer um, Cedo, John Barton and Joe Jacobs are still with me today you know yeah. um, fantastic servants and, and great guys as well you know from five years ago and, and really did put um, a good platform down for that season's success and unfortunately losing in the playoffs at Wembley, but um, no, a, a magnificent turnaround from the year before. I mean, yeah, obviously, let's talk about that, those playoffs. Obviously, you ended up finishing in the playoffs as a result of finishing a point behind Berry. You go into those playoffs, obviously, your first Wembley final as a manager. What was your approach like sort of in the build-up to that final? Um, yeah, it was quite quite calm. We, we'd done brilliantly in the, in the semis against Plymouth. You know, it was a big side, Plymouth... Plymouth Argyle away was a big, big game, big crowd. Uh, but we were confident. We were, we were super confident, you know. Um, just maybe just lost a tiny bit of momentum towards the end of the season. We lost a uh, goalkeeper. Matt Ingram uh, did his medial ligament. Um, you know, we uh, we lost Sam Saunders a minute into the game at Wembley. You know? So we were confident, but we just, looking back, we just had a little couple of things that had gone against us. It just weakened us enough to uh, to let South End in, but we almost pulled that off and uh, for the one of 20 seconds we'd have been in League One. But again, I always say if we'd have gone up that season, maybe I wouldn't be sat here now because we weren't ready by any means. You know, we, we were 
we're a club that had massively overachieved, played at Wembley and uh, and just missed out. But financially, it, it did wonders for the club, set us up for the next few years, and uh, and it's amazing how things work out like that. But um, the heartbreak was was not nice for the boys. I, I remember that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Gareth, you were named you were named manager of the year that year, wasn't you? Was did it did it kind of did it, did it not matter that the fact that you got that award because ultimately you you not got and got promotion? Uh, no, you know I was proud of the award. I, I really was. Um, in my second full season as a manager to win manager of the year, you know, I, I, I was I was very proud. Um, yeah, the, the not winning promotion bit, I, I was I was okay with. You know, I was a little yeah. bit gutted, but it. It was just the turnaround from the season before was the most important thing for me. And yeah. I think that overshadowed not winning at Wembley, which is a crazy thing to say because of course you want to win at Wembley and get promoted. But deep down as a manager, the turnaround from the year before, knowing we were in a good stead. I had, I had these players on two, two year contracts, three year contracts, some of them. So I knew we had a good foundation to build on. And, uh, and that's how I've, I've sort of conducted things ever since. And, uh, and so, yeah, Proud to have won that. Um, the loss, you win some, you lose some. Believe me, that that is. Don't be too high and too low. Um, but I think the bigger picture was important to me that year. Yeah, like you said um, earlier on. Obviously, in that 2015-16 season, it was it was quite evident that obviously Wickham were going through a bit of a financial strain. Um, obviously, losing losing the academy didn't help. Um, and then just becoming kind of one team as such was was it was it hard to, to focus during those times or was it a case that no you we are we are building we are building something here and and it will it will come to fruition eventually yeah the mentality was really important that season so losing a lot we knew where we were we we would always we would always build ourselves as the underdogs we were the underdogs you know and we were and we still are many times today but. Um, that season especially, so much had gone against us, James. You know, that it was a, it was a real. It, it, we built on that. We built and we used that, you know. And uh, and I think it was, uh, you know, again the, the the strength of the mind and and that 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 mental side that's so important to me now. Um, I started communicating better with the boys. I had relationships that again I think is my biggest strength even now as a manager. Relationships and. Um, and it, yeah, it was a great season, and uh, like I say, it was it was more impressive than people will will know because of the, the what was going on behind the scenes. You know, you obviously you can't spill all the beans about no. what happened behind the scenes, but it was chaos sometimes, and it was working with absolute peanuts, and uh, and we we pulled it off, and and I'm glad to say we put the foundations in place to where we are today. I mean, yeah, that period between 2015 and 2017, I mean, you took Aston Villa to a replay. You very almost beat Spurs and White Hart Lane. Mm. What were they like as experiences? Yeah, amazing. You know, as, as a manager, that was... The Man United one was different. Uh, I was just taking the reins, like I say. And, and young as a manager, you know, Ian Dowie had won the round before for QPR. So the Man United one wasn't really meaning with me. But Aston Villa was was me. Tottenham was me. I'd, I'd been in charge in the rounds early. We'd, we'd, we'd celebrate together as manager and players about these 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 rules. We'd watch the draw together. This was me as a manager going against these big teams. And, and it they were fantastic experiences. You know, I can't thank the boys enough for performing the way they did in those games. They were awesome. You know, they really were. And, uh, and I, I'm just so, so proud that I've, I've been able to lead teams out of those. You know, I think yeah. we're the away team to score three goals at White Hart Lane. So that's quite a nice thing. To yeah, uh, Pochettino was sat there thinking, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I remember after, after the game, he said to me, um, I didn't realise how much the FA Cup meant to this country. So uh, if wow. anything, we, uh, you know, we made, we, we put a mark on Pochettino. I think he, he you know, he, he was taking it seriously. Is, after that, yeah. is, that, is that a bit of a shame though, Gareth, is that obviously the FA Cup is... Well, I, I still regard it growing up as well, and I still regard it now. is It is the best football competition in in the world. Yeah, yeah. Is it a bit of a shame that people coming over here don't really respect it? Not respect yeah. it, but you know what I mean. Gather yeah, it for what I, it for what it is. I think I think being fair to the foreign managers who come over, they they probably have trophies in their countries or or that aren't 
aren't that don't go back as far as they figure this is this is going back hundreds of years this is this is the tournament in football to win you know it, it's it's right from the start and i think that, um, our pyramid is something to be so proud of 92 teams no other country has 92 teams but it's not just 92 teams that compete for this it's thousands of teams that go right down to grassroots i'm, I'm not sure any other country has what we have in this so i think it's probably a lack of knowledge of it than rather than, yeah. than just coming over and not not you know it it was uh it was a special moment i think that um for me to 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 sort of make such a big team respect the fa cup so they do i mean i remember watching watching uh tottenham win win winning the fa cup you know back it's uh, it's just it's it's inc- I'm playing in the finals and you know it's just incredible um so the club's always respected at tottenham but i think the Premier League overshadowed it and we lost it a little bit. And I'm just hoping that we can still keep this fantastic tradition because, you know, there's there's so much history in that, that tournament. And I'm with you, James. I think it's the best cup competition in the world. And to win the FA Cup is right up there with the league with me. It really is. You know, that is a special moment. And uh, cup final day is always going to be special in our house. I mean, yeah, moving on to that 2017-2018 season, I mean, the season of promotion... What was it about that set of players, if you could nail it down to one key attribute, which really obviously propelled the team to success? Yeah, do you know, Jacob, we've been bubbling for a couple of years. Probably just a couple of signings. Adam Elab came in uh, as a centre-back. I played against him in the Championship when I was at QPR. I was at Brighton, a real leader, a real warrior type. I thought we needed at the back. Um, Craig Mikel smith Nathan Tyson... You know, these experienced boys had been there and done it before. Um, they, they were important to me. They, 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 the ones who, Sam Saunders, I think, Marcus Bean, you know, these were players that, I think we had the oldest squad in the league by a long way, but they'd all been there. They'd all done it. They all knew what it took to be promoted. So it was me then balancing the injury list, injuries with, with these, these players that had been there, done it, and, and I knew to get promoted or knew the way out of leagues. Uh, Akin Fenwer, of course, you know, absolute talisman up front, scattered with some some real up and coming good youngsters, and uh, and really it, it had been bubbling, but those final names, Mikael Smith, Tyson, Elab, Brown, just got us over the line, and uh, and I think we, uh, you know, we 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 deserved it that year. We really really performed well, and. Uh, and it was a surprise going up at Chesterfield. We didn't, we weren't expected to do it there. But um, one of these young players, let's talk about Dominic Gape. You know what a what a fantastic strike from him, and uh, and rewarding us with a with a brilliant promotion. So no, real real pleased. Uh, just just needed to add just that little bit of experience, I thought, and uh, and we did it. I mean, yeah, finishing third that season. Towards the end of the season, what was it like? Especially maybe proving any doubters wrong. I mean, having one of the oldest squads in the league. I mean, that's quite an achievement then going and getting promoted a bit as well, don't you think? Yeah. And do you know what? I didn't have to tell the boys to prove people wrong. They they wanted to do it because, you know, earlier in this interview, I said when you're 21, you don't really take too much in, you know, but when you're older, you really do. You really have points to prove. And they did. Those boys had points to prove. And, uh, and you know, we had some fantastic games. There's some, I mean, the crew games, I remember we scored going last minute Tyson one and Mikael Smith in the other um I can found with some some really important goals you know we, we we had some some real special moments uh looting away Nathan Tyson again just rolling back the years and uh and so I'll I'll, uh, I'll always remember that season with with Will Fond and uh just uh, in touch with a lot of the boys now today we had a we had a big zoom call the other day and uh and it's great to see a lot of those old boys still relishing in that promotion year do you think there was a time during that season where you could really pinpoint it and, and mark it as a turning point where you kind of had a feeling that you were going to go on and do great things? No, we, we played Lincoln City away on a Tuesday night and uh, ironically our football throws things up. They were, they were fancy. They were a real strong team and going to Lincoln under the Cowley brothers was really tough. And I picked the oldest team I could pick, the most experienced team I could pick. And we... We slowed the tempo down. We ground everything out. We and we almost nicked it. But that point away at Lincoln was probably the turning point where we all thought, you know what, we could do this. We 
we were expected to get beat there. And, and the Luton game, if I'm sitting, being honest, both of those games, Luton were flying top of the league, Nathan Jones, best team in the land, plenty of money, good system. We beat them 3-2. Uh, and then up at Lincoln, nil-nil. There's two huge games not, within quite small space of each other as well. Um, were two momentous occasions where I thought, we're, we're going to do this. And, uh, and yeah, we did with a game to spare, which was great. I mean, yeah, bringing us up to date this season now, obviously battling towards the top ends of League One all season. It's been widely publicised, obviously new owners coming in, investing money. I mean, it must have been a joy this season to work under the club. Yeah, do you know, I think uh, the stats the other day we're looking at, we've been in the top two more than any other team this season in the league. You know, I think a total of 20 weeks, Wickham have been in the top two. And to say that after five years ago, we are still on the edge of Torquay, you know, it's just phenomenal, uh, and I I can't thank the players enough. They've been they've been superb in what I you know what I've tried to instill and, and the culture I give them, and not just as footballers as people. They're real good people. Um, like I say, this this terrible pandemic has has affected a lot of things, but I've been really proud of the boys the way they've handled it. Um, and the new owners coming in, yeah, I feel for them because it's very close to the lockdown when they took the club over and. Uh, and yeah. Rob Quigg, the, uh, the American guy's done nothing but pay wages at the moment for no return. But um, I'm sure there's good times to come and, and, and plenty of payback for him. But, um, you know, at the moment, uh, we've just got to hope that everyone stays safe and we get through this first and foremost. Uh, and then football comes out in a healthy position as well. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a great season, uh, premature end, but uh, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll be able to finish it somehow. Yeah, I mean, you say there about the, the pandemic and, and Wigan doing so well, Gareth. Do you, it's, it, I know it's a bit of a tough question, but obviously there's, there's, there's been plenty of meetings with the EFL and things like that, hasn't there? Whether, whether the season should be played or, or shouldn't be played and things like that. In, in your opinion, does, does, yeah. does the football need to come back? The fairest way to do this would be play every game, play the season out. Um, I understand financially it's going to be super, super tough for some clubs, including ours, you know, including ours. So I can't speak for the owners, but as a footballer and a football manager, you want to play your games. You you believe in your team. You know, we had two games in hand with a couple of teams. We had one game in hand with everyone else. Um, people look at this current situation and say, oh, Wickham are benefiting. They've gone from eighth to third in points per game. And I'm saying, no, we want the season to carry on because we don't want to finish there. I want to finish in that top two. Um, I, I believe we can finish in that top two if you give us all the games. We've got some real good fixtures coming up. Um, if it happens the other way, it happens. Um, I understand with clubs and finances. Uh, like I say, I just hope that going forward, football comes out of this healthy because we've got a, a brilliant pyramid. Something to be so, so proud of, honestly. Um, the four divisions are just awesome and, and the non-leagues under that as well. Um, so that's the most important thing. It's got to survive. But, um, yeah, we've we'll, we'll got to wait and see. Um, looking forward to coming back. I've seen plenty of press today about the Premier League all contact training and things. Things are looking up. Um, yeah. But, you know, the, uh, the most important thing is everyone stays safe and, uh, and we, can, we can stop people dying first. That's the, that's the big thing. Definitely. Um, just to finish off this little chat, Gareth, uh, we always ask every guest to pick their, to pick their, their six society. I know you've been thinking about it all day. Sorry, mate. <laughs> this is going to be so tough, I tell I know, you. Be, I'll put you right on the spot here. <laughs> um, yeah, come on, come on, mate. If if you could, if you could pick your favourite all-time Six Society team, who would you who would you go for? You know what? Um, I'd have to go for. I think Neil Sullivan in goal. I played with him at Wimbledon. He was the Scotland number one. Uh, and he, he was he was a good keeper, you know. I think closely followed by Lee Camp, who's playing at Birmingham still, you know. But Neil Sullivan, I think, would be uh, would be up there. Sully was great, you know, real good and good character as well. Um, God, at the back, uh, I think Alfie. I'd have to I'd have to stick in there, you know. As as a manager, he saw he saw everything. Uh, Two footed, you know, would read the game well. Not sure I'd be at five aside, but um, I was six aside, so we, we'd have to see on that one. Um, that's two. I'm, I'm picking myself, right? I've got to pick myself, so that's three. Um, ever reach easy, okay? The QPR, absolute. This boy will go all the way. You know, I really believe it. He's, uh, 
he's got everything and and I'll put I, I've got to put him as the best player I've ever coached um wow. some of the skills he's got and some of the you know some of the, the stuff he can do with the ball he had the knack of pushing the ball into a space where nobody was there would be there'd be there'd be 10 people around him and he'd find the space that one person wasn't and he, he was just so good um and he's still so young and learning the game um where else are we going? Robbie Earl, I'd say midfield. You know, pleasure to play. You know, obviously big Jamaican international. I think he scored the first goal for Jamaica in the World Cup, the, the reggae boys. Um, and a real gent as well. Um, and then lastly, who would I stick up front? I would probably stick up front. I'd probably stick Kevin Gallon. You know, I think for, for the player he was at QPR, um, goal machine. Goal machine, big games, big goals. Kev, Kev was always there on the spot, uh, and he was great for a night out after as well. So there's my six. <laughs> what a perfect way to finish this great <laughs> chat with, like I said earlier when when I first introduced him, the one of the best managers in the football league, and what a wonderful job he has done with Wickham Wanderers. Um, what a career! What a, what a great story you've been listening to for the for nearly two hours now um thank you gareth ever so much for coming on it's okay. been an absolute pleasure to to listen to your career and and really all the best from 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 us to to wickham wanderers and yourself no um, thank, thank you you know and, and listen you guys nobody gives you guys credit for putting these great podcasts together while while it's in such an important time as well so keep it going guys i know uh we're not the superstars of, of the Premier League, but there's a lot of good stories in the AFL and, uh, and so I appreciate you putting them on. Thank you. Thank perfect. you. What a, what a perfect way to end the podcast. You've been watching Inside the Changing Room.